This exercise is meant to um, deepen your understanding of the fractional quantum Hall effect. For this purpose we've um, posed a set of six questions which we will answer now uh, one after the other. The first question in this exercise is under which experimental conditions can one observe the fractional quantum Hall effect? And there was a hint given that you should look at temperature, mobility and magnetic field. Of course the answer to this question depends on the characteristic energy scale that is associated with the fractional Hall effect, a fractional quantum Hall effect, and this energy scale which we call delta is um, approximately given by a numerical constant times the Coulomb interaction e squared divided by epsilon epsilon naught times the magnetic length which takes the place of the distance between the electrons. This magnetic length Lc is usually given as the square root of Planck's constant divided by the elementary charge times the applied magnetic field. This constant um, is predicted by theory to be um, close to a percent roughly of the expression that we have here. So if you put in numbers um, and typical magnetic fields you end up with energy scales delta that are of the order of uh, 1 to 2 Kelvin at magnetic fields let's say of about 10 Tesla. Now we have to compare this energy scale with energy scales that arise in our experiments, for example temperature. So we will only be able to observe the fractional quantum Hall effect if KBT, the temperature scale, is significantly smaller than this energy gap delta. A second requirement of course is that the mobility mu which contains the scattering rate of the electrons because it's given by elementary charge times scattering time divided by the effective mass m star this mobility should be large enough such that this order, which you may estimate as being h bar divided by tau, uh, that this order is small compared to the energy scale delta. So from experience we can say that this requires mobilities typically larger than 10 to the 6 centimeter squared per volt second. Furthermore, we will look at the magnetic length dependence of delta and see that the magnetic length is inversely proportional to square root of the magnetic field such that delta is proportional to magnetic field to the power of one half. And this means the energy scale delta gets the bigger the larger the magnetic field is. So another criterion for observing the fractional quantum Hall effect is that you use sufficiently large magnetic field which amounts to something of the order of 
5 to 10 Tesla in typical experimental situations. So to sum up the answer to the first question, the energy scale delta, which can be in fact measured by activation um, experiments in certain fractional filling factor minima of the longitudinal resistivity, this activation energy delta sets the scale, energy scale on which uh, the effect can be observed. And we have to make sure that temperature is small and disorder is small compared to this energy scale for observing the effect. What can help is to use a large magnetic field. The larger the field, the larger the energy scale delta will be. The second question in this exercise um, asks you to determine the mean free path for electrons in a sample with a given mobility and a given density. And then it asks what consequences can you draw regarding the experiment. The mobility given is mu is equal to 20 million centimeter squared per volt second and the density given n is equal to 1 times 10 to the 11 per square centimeter. Now in order to uh, solve this exercise we have to remind ourselves that the mobility is related to the scattering time mu is e the elementary charge times scattering time divided by the effective mass m star, such that knowing the mobility, we can calculate the scattering time tau. Furthermore, we know that the mean free path, L, is given by the Fermi velocity times um, the scattering time tau in diffusive transport. Um, so we need to know the Fermi velocity and the Fermi velocity itself is given by the momentum of electrons at the Fermi energy h bar kf divided by the effective mass m star. How do we get the Fermi wave vector Kf? This is related to the density in a 2D electron gas. So the Fermi wave vector Kf is given by square root of 2 pi times the density of electrons in the electron gas. Um, so now using this Kf, inserting it here gives us the Fermi velocity and calculating tau from mu gives us um, the tau that we need here and then we can calculate the mean free path. Now plugging these numbers in and uh, calculating the mean free path gives you a number L of approximately 100 micrometer, 0.1 millimeter. This is quite a remarkable distance and uh, it of course has consequences for the experiment. If you do the quantum Hall effect measurement uh, using a Hall bar structure, then you want to make sure that the transport occurring in your sample, in your Hall bar, is diffusive. This requires that the sample size, which is, for example, the Hall bar width, the whole bar width denoted by W and the whole bar length denoted by L, they should both be much bigger than the mean free path L. Now given that the mean free path in these very high mobility samples is already 0.1 millimeter, 100 microns, you want to make sure that your sample is at least, let's say, a millimeter in width and uh, the length between voltage probes should also be at least one millimeter, if not more. 
The third question that needs to be answered in this exercise is the question um, why minima in magnetoresistance occur at uneven denominator fraction filling factors. In order to answer this question, we have to come back to our theoretical description of the fractional quantum Hall effect. And in particular, we will look at the composite fermion picture, which essentially states that the fractional quantum Hall effect is the integer quantum Hall effect of composite fermions. And composite fermions consist of an electron with two flux quanta attached. Now within the composite fermion picture, we worked out that the filling factor nu at which um, the fractional quantum Hall states occur is related to the effective filling factor for composite fermions by nu effective divided by one plus two times nu effective. Now considering cases where the effective filling factor is an integer plus minus one plus minus two and so on we see that the denominator which is twice this integer this will always be even but then we are adding one which means the denominator will always be odd. In the fourth question of this exercise, um, you are asked in which cases composite fermions and in which cases composite bosons are an appropriate description of the situation occurring at specific filling factors. Again, for, this, for the answer to this question, you have to invoke our theoretical understanding of the effect. So remember that composite bosons were um, arising in connection to Laughlin's description of the fractional quantum Hall effect. And in this case, one electron was attached to two flux quanta, uh, three flux quanta. in case of filling factor one third or to five flux quanta in case of filling factor one fifth and, the, and so on. So the basic idea here was that in these cases we talk about composite bosons because the quasi-particle excitations of these states have bosonic character under the exchange of two quasi-particles. Now, in contrast, the composite fermion picture had one electron married to two flux quanta, an even number of flux quanta, which was equivalent to composite fermions. In this case, the quasi-particle excitations behave as fermions under particle exchange. If you're interested in a nice explanation of the composite boson and composite fermion character. You can uh, look at the paper um, which I reference here, uh, published in PNAS 
96, page 8821 in 1999, where the relation between the two descriptions is described in a relatively simple language. The fifth question in this exercise is, are effects of interaction also important in the integer quantum Hall effect? The answer to this question is, of course, yes, they are. And I want to mention two instances that we have discussed in the lecture. The first of them is the edge reconstruction that we saw. which led to compressible and incompressible stripes along the sample edge, simply mediated by the Hartree interaction. The second effect I would like to mention here is the observation of odd integer filling factors So we see in the experiment plateaus at filling factor 1, 3, 5 and so on, which tells us that Landau levels are not spin degenerate. This is very hard to understand based on the very small Zeeman splitting that you usually have, for example, in gallium arsenide two-dimensional electron gases. And the reason for the observation turns out to be an exchange enhanced spin splitting. The last question in this exercise um, was to describe an experiment to characterize the existence of a Fermi surface for quasi-particles. Now, this is a um, question that requires a little bit of creativity. And let me first mention that there has been a number of such experiments which you can find in the um, references that I've written down here for your convenience. Now, just to give you a general idea um, how such an experiment could look like, you may want to think about um, ways how you can steer electrons, for example, in K space at zero magnetic field around the Fermi surface. And one way is, for example, to apply a magnetic field and to allow particles to move on a cyclotron orbit. You know, the whole semi-classical transport theory for electrons in a magnetic field is essentially based on the property that electrons um, occupy um, states up to the Fermi energy and that transport takes place at the Fermi energy at the Fermi surface. So typical experiments Probing the Fermi surface would therefore use the magnetic field to um, steer electrons around obstacles. For example, you could form two nar narrow constrictions in an electron gas like this. You could inject electrons through one constriction and use the perpendicular magnetic field to steer electrons around on a circle and measure how many of them arrive at um, the second slit. Now, in order for this to occur, you, of course, need to apply the appropriate 
magnetic field such that the charge divided by mass ratio for the particles um, exactly focuses uh, the particles back on the second slit. Now in case of composite fermions of course the charge is the elementary charge but the um, the mass is entirely made up from Coulomb interaction. And there are theoretical predictions for the composite fermion effective mass um, at particular magnetic fields and they could be measured in such an experiment. Another way of doing something similar is to have obstacles in a sample that are periodically arranged. For example, you may um, produce something like antidot lattices, which consists of holes, regularly placed holes in a 2D electron gas. And in such a case, it turns out that for electrons, the in-plane resistance is maximum at magnetic fields when the electrons encircle a group of these obstacles exactly. So that could be four as I've drawn it here, but it could also happen at higher magnetic fields that you just encircle one of them. We call these commensurability uh, conditions and under these conditions the resistance will have a maximum. Now observing commensurability um, oscillations in the magnetoresistance for composite fermions has also been one of the experiments which essentially made use of the fact that there is a Fermi surface for composite fermions.